Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to First Aid AMC Random Recall Session class. My name is uh, Rabia. I'm one of the mentors associated with First Aid AMC course. I hope you have been enjoying our free trial sessions with Dr. Arshan. Let's just wait a couple of more minutes so that maximum number of participants can join and then we will start the random recall sessions in which I will be discussing the recent recall questions and discuss the tricks with you about how to solve the question in minimum uh, amount of time and how to manage yourself in the exam. Now, um, with the first aid AMC course, um, for the MCQ participants. It's a five month course as already been discussed by Dr. Arshan in the first class. Um, but in this course, he is the main um, tutor who will be going through every theoretical class with you regarding every subject that comes in the AMC MCQ exam. And myself and two other mentors will be taking your recall sessions in which we will be discussing the recent recalls that are coming in the exams month-wise and try to get as much number of recalls past your eyes as possible and discuss with you about the best way to approach them and the best way to solve them in um, using minimum amount of time so that you can pass your exams with flying colors. Now, there are a couple of things that I always tell my students that I use um, in the AMC and when I used in during my own preparation as well. So I always tell you guys about what sort of resources I am taking or I am consulting when I'm looking for an answer for a specific recall. So first of all is your jam, um, eighth edition or whatever is the latest edition. This is your main book that you will be consulting and going through with Dr. Arshan so that you have a very good basic concepts about the things that are being constantly being asked in the exam itself. Now with the Australian health system, they always follow guidelines which are updated very frequently. Now there are a lot of resources from where you can study these guidelines from any of the state um, healthcare system, you can check these guidelines like South Australian Health Guidelines, Queensland Health Guidelines, New South Wales, Victorian Guidelines. These are the major things that you can do. If you are looking for the things that are usually asked from a uh, general practitioner point of view, you can always consult RACGP for this. Also, I use a couple of um, other guidelines as well, especially regarding orthopedics, which is the ortho bullets. Which these are very much um, comprehensive and to the point they have written things about a particular topic. And basically it has everything you need to prepare for the AMC MCQ exam. Also, sometimes for hematology, we also consult med bullets um, because they have some scenarios given in, on the top of the start of the topic that also is relative to your exam as well. So these are some resources you, sh you guys should be aware of um, whenever I'm discussing about the guidelines so that if you are confused about something, you can just write it in the Google bar, the search bar, and it can come up and you can easily uh, go through your way of discussing the guidelines or just looking through them. Now let's start with the recall session. Is everyone able to hear my voice clearly? Because I, sometimes I have some issues with the students about the voice quality. So if you have some issues, please let me know in the chat box. Also, um, if you know about the answers, I would recommend you to write in the chat box. It uh, allows you to participate in the conversations that we are going to be having while discussing the AMC MCQ recall session, okay? All right. 
Now, first question. Whenever we are looking at the stem of the question, always look at the key things that the that this question is being asked at. So the key question things are, for example, a 50-year-old woman presents to the primary care physician office with the symptoms of dry eyes and mouth persistently. She reports that this started several months ago, so we know it's a chronic disease and has not improved. She has been using, using artificial tears for the past few weeks without much relief. She also reports feeling very tired and anxious. She has a past medical history of SLE and a family history of the rheumatoid arthritis. Physical examination reveals that the patient have very dry mucous membranes, swollen parotid glands, conjunctivitis on the exam. She is prescribed pilocarpine and sent for an autoimmune workup with positive Sherman test. What is the next most appropriate management you would require for this patient? Option A, topical methylcellulose. Option B, hydrochlorothiazide. Option C, methotrexate. Option D, steroids. Very good. So what you guys are thinking about, can anyone tell me what's this disease that we are discussing? Can anyone tell me the name of the disease? Very good. So Sjogren syndrome. In Sjogren syndrome, it's an autoimmune disorder and basically it's associated with the HLA-D573. And in this disease, we have decreased production of secretions in the body, especially it affects the sclerotic glands and the tear glands, lacrimal glands. So a patient will present to you with dry eyes, dry mouth. Because of the decreased production, the parotid glands will be swollen. And they have some extra, um, uh, they have some other manifestations as well. These patients will have some joint disorders, some cutaneous problems as well. And one of the risk factors are they might have uh, autoimmune connective disorder like systemic lupus erythematosus or rheumatoid arthritis. And they are at risk of developing um, lymphomas because these patients are have lymphoid tissues inside the uh, autoimmune disorder. So they are at risk of having the mucus associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. So if the patient is not responding to artificial tears, then we need to move towards a more potent lubricant because we need to cure the dryness. Otherwise, the patient will have keratoconjunctivitis, right? So topical methyl cellulose. Hydrochlorothiazide is a diuretic. It has no role in the management of the Sjogren syndrome. It will make the patient more dry rather than making them moist. Methotrexate can be used, but it, it has limited role, same as the steroids. Limited role sometimes can be used in the flare-ups with other presentations, not with the dry eyes and dry mucous membrane presentation. So I always give links like these, and you can just click them, and they will take you to whatever guideline or whatever article we are going to be looking at. Uh, for the answers of the question. I'm just going to open up this one. She is already on eye drops. So methyl cellulose is a better eye drop. It kind of stays and provides more lubrication. Okay, so this is taking a bit of time. All right. So Musculoskeletal Society of Australia has given you a better understanding of the Sjogren syndrome. Things to remember is that it affects the glands in your body that makes the moisture and it causes the dryness in the eyes and mouth. There's no cure, but it can be managed. It's an autoimmune disease. It results because of the faulty immune system and it is can be mild, moderate or severe. Causes, 
it's more in the patients who already have some autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, or lupus. Common symptoms are dry eyes and dry mouth. Other areas which can be affected are the swelling and tenderness of the sweating glands around the face, neck, armpits, and groin region. Tiredness, which is a kind of a um, constitutional symptom. Dry skin and rashes, joint pain, general achiness, dryness of the nose, ears, and throat. Vaginal dryness, very common symptoms in the female. They can be coming to you with the... Um, this periunia or sometimes with the tears as well. So this is one of the symptoms you might be looking for as the Dogen syndrome is more common in the females. Complications, as there is decreased amount of um, moisture and mucus production, there will be increased amount of dental decay. There will be increased development of the thrush infections in the body as there's no saliva to swept all the bugs in the mouth. There can be vision problems as conjectivitis, inflammation of the internal organs can happen, problems with the circulatory system as well. Diagnosis, can anyone tell me about the diagnosis, what the blood test we do for the Sjogren syndrome? There are two antibodies or two antibodies that we look for in Sjogren syndrome. Can anyone tell me the name of them? Anti-Rho and Anti-La. These are the specific antibodies we look for and the generalized one that we do is the ANA and the rheumatoid factor. These are the specific autoantibodies that we look for. Very good. Very good. Biopsy from the thyroid gland is only done when your Anti-Rho and Anti-La are negative. If they are positive, we don't go for the biopsy. Biopsy is the diagnostic test. Initial test is the anti rho anti la ANA, RF antibodies. Schermer test can also be done. It's a special type of blotting paper that is held uh, on the eye to measure the tear production. Eye examination and biopsy of the slivery gland under microscope, it shows lymphoid tissue um, infiltration. Treatment, lubricating ointments and artificial tears, artificial saliva for the patient, mouth rinses and lozenges, nasal spray, vaginal lubricant, moisturizers or emollients for the skin. Sometimes NSAIDs can help provide temporary pain relief, especially when they're having joint pains. Corticosteroid injections, temporary treatment for the joint pain, immunosuppressant medication, when there is an acute flare-up leading to complications, okay? So immunosuppressant medication is the third line and it's only used when the complications are not being controlled in it. Self-management is that we always provide a sort of uh, um, education to the patient about how to avoid over drying of their body. They are positive, but they are more specific to Sjogren syndrome and you relate the things with the symptoms. So it's not only the autoantibodies that are positive, dryness of the eyes, dryness of the mouth, swollen parotid glands, joint problems, and then you do the ANA, RF, anti rho anti -la. If they are positive, then you think that that's right. The patient is having Sjogren's syndrome. And the diagnostic, if there is an inflammation of the parotid gland, you can take the biopsy from that. Slavery gland. Cool. Any questions, anybody? All good? No worries. What, uh, what is um, what is that? Is are you asking about the treatment, doctor? The TX treatment. I have, as I have already said, it's a symptomatic treatment. We don't. It's there is no curative treatment for Sjogren syndrome. So you do artificial tears, you do lubrication, you do artificial saliva. You can manage the pain of the joints with the simple NSAIDs or sometimes corticosteroid injections. And when the patient is having multi-organ failure, then you can start the patient on the immunosuppressive therapy. But that therapy will only be started by the specialist, that is the rheumatologist, not by a general practitioner. 
or a junior house officer. So your exam in AMC MCQ, they will ask you questions about the level of a junior doctor. So even if you are a specialist in your field, try to think what's the basic thing you will do for the patient so that the patient is having appropriate care and you're being a safe doctor. That's what they want from you. All right, a patient presented to, because they're asking about the lubrication. She is coming to you with the eyes and the dryness of the mouth. She's not coming to you with the pains in the joint. If she was, then steroidal injections inside the joint would be a good option. That's why steroids are not the first line treatment for the dryness. It's the first line treatment sorry, second line treatment for the joint pain associated with Sjogren's syndrome. All right. A patient presented to GP clinic with upper eyelid swelling, red eye, and epiphora. Visual equity is normal, so pay very good attention here. There is no nausea and vomiting. They have basically given you the diagnosis. No other symptoms. Which one of the following is the diagnosis? Conjunctivitis, orbital cellulitis, periorbital cellulitis, or angioedema? There is upper lid swelling and only one eye, right? Eye is red and lacrimation is happening. There is no pain in the eye. There is no nausea vomiting. There is visual equity is normal. What it is? Very good. This is viral conjunctivitis, guys. Or bacterial conjunctivitis. If there was like a purulent discharge, it might have been a bacterial conjunctivitis as well. Angioedema will be severe swelling. The swelling will be severe and there will be redness of the eyelid in such a way that you will be able to see the vessels. There will be, a, it will be like an, um, it will be like a hemangioma type of redness. Not the simple redness, which is associated with the um, inflammation. Epiphora doctor means um, excessive lacrimation, excessive tearing of the eyes, excessive production of the tears. So whenever there is conjunctivitis, there will be inflammation of the eye conjunctiva, there will be inflammation of the eyelid because conjunctiva is surrounding the inner part of the eyelid as well, right? There are two types of conjunctiva and excessive watering from the eyes. These are the um, cardinal symptoms of the conjunctivitis. And in conjunctivitis, there will be no change in the vision. Whereas in orbital cellulitis, it's like a systemic fever will be there. Patient will have very severe pain in the eye. Conjunctivitis is not painful. It's like a foreign body sensation in the eye. There is not much pain. It's more of a discomfort. It's not pain. If they are also talking about severe pain, then think about cellulitis, periorbital cellulitis or orbital cellulitis, depending that the patient is having fever or not. But in conjunctivitis, there will be no pain. There will be a foreign body sensation. There will be discomfort, redness of the conjunctiva and excessive lacrimation. So, let me just show you guys. There is a wonderful table discussed by the um, RACGP, I think, if I'm not mistaken. They talk about every red eye problem. So our answer here is the conjunctivitis. Let me just do this. All right, uh, New South Wales. So this is the New South Wales link. Just click the space bar and put control and click on the link. It will open up. Eye emergency manual. So this has everything you need regarding the opt ophthalmology um, in your exam. So let's quickly go to slit lamp, trauma. See, everything is there. Conjunctivitis, I'm looking for conjunctivitis. Good. 
the die 42. Okay. Let's move to page 42 quickly. Sorry, my laptop is playing up a bit. Trying to move too quickly here. In JM also, there is a very, very nice table they have given you that you can study the conjunctivitis from. And they have written about types of red eye, acute red eye, chronic red eye, painful red eye, painless red eye. So corneal foreign body. See, this guideline has everything you need to know as well. All right, diffuse conjunctival injection. Viral conjunctivitis, contact history with recent eye or upper respiratory tract infection symptoms, especially in the children, burning sensation and watery discharge, different from purulent exudate in the bacterial infection, classically begins in one eye with the rapid spread to the other. Precautions, what you can do is wash hand, use separate tissues to avoid the infection of the other eye or um, cool compressions, Sometimes lubricants can also help. Antibiotics, if it is purulent, we never give steroids to the patient. Resolution may take week. All right. And bacterial conjunctivitis, there will be tender inflamed conjunctiva with the purulent discharge. No corneal or anterior chamber is involved. Patient is systemically well. Treatment is you maintain the hygiene, you wash the hand and give chloramphenicol eye drops for Four, day, four times a day for five days. All right, so this is your answer over here. You can also study presacral or cellulitis, sorry, pre-orbital cellulitis, orbital cellulitis from here as well. All right, guys. Any question? All right. Next one, a patient is having menstruation and now she's coming to you with itchiness and redness without any discharge. Which one of the following is the management? Do nothing, give cranberry capsule, metronidazole, amoxicillin or vaginal douching. Very important clue have been given to you in question. Patient is menstruating and she is complaining of itchiness and some redness. What are you going to do? So I think all of the females are right. We are going to do nothing here. When the menstruation happens, guys, there is a hormonal change that can cause excessive itchiness in the vaginal area and redness as a result of that as well because of because there is increased um, breakdown of the endometrial layer there can be increased hormonal response to the skin as well and becomes a bit sensitive sometimes the itchiness and the redness is in response to the type of the um, pads the patient is using sometimes it can be because of the hygiene problem as well so in that, that case, we'll just ask the patient to maintain hygiene and do nothing. If the itchiness is not getting better and you think that the patient is complaining of dysuria, now patient is complaining of a discharge coming from the um, vaginal area other than the menstruating uh, blood, then you might need to investigate it further. Can it be a UTI? Can it be a uterine or vaginal infection? Then we need to take a... Uh, uh, urine sample for the UTI and a vaginal sample with the endocervical sample if the patient is complaining or having systemic features as well and then investigate for the cause of the infection. 
Here is just menstruation, itchiness and redness is very common symptoms of the menstruation. So we do nothing for the patient. We just ask them to maintain hygiene. Okay. So if you look over here, this may result from hormonal changes or allergies. Which I, vaginal itching during a period can occur as a result of normal hormonal changes during menstruation. It may also signal a sensitivity or allergy to sanitary pads, tampons, and other hygienic products a person may be using during their periods. So if, if instead of do nothing, they have given you an option of maintaining hygiene, go for that, okay? Sometimes the best answer is no answer at all. And they confuse you like that in the AMC exam. All right. Any questions from the previous one, guys? So always try to go with the simplest approach. In AMC exam, simplest approach is the best approach to pass the exam. Don't try to complicate things. Wherever they will ask you complicated stuff, start from the beginning and do, go towards the complications. It will be helpful. Now, next question is, look at the image. It's the right breast of the patient. And she is coming with the redness of the area surrounding the areola and right upper quadrant. What advice will you give to a mother? So a mother, they have told you. So a mother means she is lactating. So what, what sort of uh, disease the patient is suffering from? Very good, mastitis. Now, what advice would you give to her regarding breastfeeding? Option A, uh, extract and discard the milk from the right side where she is having the mastitis. Don't feed from the right, but feed from the left breast. Apply cold pack or frequent feeding from both sides. Excellent, guys. So. Always remember, in mastitis, we or breast abscess, unless it's not in in breast abscess, which is not communicating with the lactiferous ducts, we always advise the patient to feed from the affected side first and then from the other side, because if the patient is not feeding and the breast is getting more engorged, it's going to worsen the mastitis. It's not going to help at all. Um, applying the cold packs. Now, regarding the cold packs and the warm packs, there is a thing that we always tell the patients that whenever she is, she is going to feed the patient, apply the warm compression from the affected side so that the lactiferous ducts are dilated and there is a easy flow of the milk and Afterwards, when she has finished the breastfeeding from the side of the mastitis, apply cold compression so that it's soothing for the pain patient is having. And then you always give flucloxacillin to the patient for at least 10 to 14 days. If it is an abscess, that if the abscess is not communicating with the lactiferous duct, we still ask them to feed from the affected side. But for the abscess, it needs to be confirmed that it's not communicating. And they will tell you something about an ultrasound finding and something about the milk, whether it's a weird in taste or something like that. They will give you a clue in the exam. Okay. All right. So this is an advice for the breastfeeding mothers who contract mastitis um, regarding the milk. So how do you know you have the mastitis? Let me just in, increase the size. They will have flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, or fast heart rate. Part of the breast look red, swollen, skin may be shiny or have red streaks. Breast will feel hot and painful to touch as well. Make sure baby's position and attached well to help them remove the milk. Treat sore or damaged nipples promptly. Start each feed on alternate breast to ensure milk is removed from both breast often. If one or both breast becomes uncomfortably full, you can wake your baby up and feed the baby from the engorged breast. If your baby is not feeding well at the breast, then you can express the milk and replace the missed breastfeeds. All right. Managing mastitis, whenever you notice, always go to your doctor and start the antibiotics right away so that we don't want the breast 
mastitis to become an abscess. All right. All good. Any question, guys? <clears throat> I and, have a question. Um, please ask uh, in the in the comment boxes. Okay. Thank you. Also, um, for the breast abscess, we always use ultrasound to tell about the depth of it. And we do the ultrasound guided aspiration. And the aspirated stuff is then sent to the cytology. If it's a very large abscess or recurrent abscess or abscess of more than three or five centimeters, then we need to go for the incision and drainage of the abscess. <clears throat> All right. Next question. If there is mastitis, if the baby get milk from the affected side, will not. No, it doesn't worsen it. Actually, if the baby is feeding from the affected side, it, it actually helps to relieve the pressure uh, of the engorged breast. Uh, because engorged breast, if the baby is not feeding, the milk will accumulate and it will cause more pain in the skin of the inf infection. If the baby is feeding the... Uh, pressure from inside to the skin will be released. It helps actually to relieve the pressure and helps in the resolution of the symptoms as well. All right, next question. A patient who has three month history of bloody diarrhea, already people are answering correctly. Um, three months history of bloody diarrhea, list of organisms are given, which of the following could be the causative agent. So we know that in bacteria, Less than two weeks, if there is bloody diarrhea, what is the most common cause of the bacteria for bloody diarrhea? E. coli, Campylobacter, very good, and Salmonella. But if it is more than two weeks, then the causative agent for the bloody diarrhea is and umiba histolytica. If it is just diarrhea and it's very. If it is just diarrhea and it is persisting for more than two weeks, bubbly, smelly, um, floaty diarrhea, then that is um, Jardia lambia. Always think about Jardia lambia. All right, guys. All right. So you can study from the RDCGP Traveler's Guide or Traveler's Diarrhea. It comes up under this uh, Salmonella is less than 12 hours. It's not a hard and fast rule, but within the first 24 hours, it's either Staphylococcus aureus that is causing the diarrhea or E. coli. And if it is persisting 12 hours, 24 hours, it can be between Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, Staphylococcus aureus as well. But if it's bloody, then you know that Staphylococcus aureus doesn't cause bloody diarrhea and you think about E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. So traveler diarrhea, causative agents are very common. For example, enterotoxic E. coli, Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonella, and Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio parahemolyticus. E. coli is the most common one. Um, other ones that we have talked about are the parasitical causes, which is Jardia lambia and um, Entomoeba histolytica. So bloody diarrhea and fever, we always uh, think about the bacterial, viral, and parasitical causes. So look at this table, guys. I'm just going to reduce the size a bit. So if a patient is having just having diarrhea, 24 hours, give oral fluids, oral rehydration solutions like hydrolyte and make sure they're having a very soft diet and avoiding any dairy products, fatty foods and spicy foods. If the patient is um, having one or more symptoms with the diarrhea, like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, stool, having mucus in it or fever, 
then you start patient on antibiotics, which is norfloxacin um, with loperamide, which acts as a antispasmodic if the patient is having cramps. If just cramps with diarrhea and no systemic feature, we don't start the antibiotics, we can add antispasmodics like uh, buscopan, loperamide. If the diarrhea starts having blood in it, then we will complete the antibiotic course for at least more seven to 10 days or five to seven days. If the diarrhea is persisting more than two weeks or more than um, a week even, we consider, and the patient is not responding to the antibiotic treatment we are giving them, then think about the amoebic dysentery and start the patient on tinidazole. All right, so they have given you good antibiotics and anti-amoebic drugs over here. Okay, any question? All right, next question. A patient with diabetes, he's on metformin two gram slow or extended release. He's having a very poor glycemic control, still the HbA1c is very high, 9.3. What is your most appropriate appropriate next action. Stop the metformin and start him on the long-acting insulin. Add long-acting insulin BD. Add short-acting after each meal. Add short-acting after meals and non-acting nocturnal. Now, there is a lot of information is missing in this recall. First of all, how do we know to add short acting with meals and long acting or basal insulin? How do we know? Do we have any preprandial diabetes? Um, blood sugar levels mentioned. Have they mentioned any postprandial? No. So this is a very incomplete question. That is why I have added it in your today's recall session that you need to know that whenever a recall like this comes in front of your eyes, please don't cram the answer because they have given you no information here. There is no gender mentioned. There is no age mentioned. There is no mention of what sort of diabetes this is. They have not mentioned the pre- uh, sorry, fasting levels and the postprandial levels of the glucose. Because if we are targeting the fasting levels, we should be adding the long-acting insulin, right? If we are targeting the postprandial, then we should be adding the short-acting before each meal or after each meal, right? They haven't given you any information like that. So this question is not a good question to base your knowledge on. What you need to know is whenever they're going to be asking you about diabetes, you should be very clear about the type of diabetes and what sort of patient medication is on and what sort of BSLs we are targeting. For example, for example, now let me just modify this question. A 63 year old male with Diabetes mellitus type 2 is on metformin, 2 gram, extended release, poor control with the HP Evans, he 9.3. His fasting BSL is 10.3 in the morning. What is your next mo most appropriate action? Now tell me the answer. Very good, Dr. Amima Imran. We will be adding the long acting because fasting is deranged, right? Not the postprandial ones. Fasting means the one in the morning. 
So we should be adding a long acting insulin. We will not be stopping the metformin. Whenever we are making a transition of the patients from the, um, not it should not be BD, I agree with you, but among these, B is the best option, okay? I know she is already on extended release, but still with the extended release, she is not having a good control of the fasting BSLs. That's why you're putting and adding another basal insulin. Whenever we are starting or transitioning a patient to an insulin regime, we never stop the oral hypoglycemics. If we are one by one stopping them, we are gradually increasing the insulin so that we are getting a balance of it and not and making sure patient is not going into hypoglycemia, right? VD will be twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. Yes, we add basal insulin. If the patient is having, for example, postperindial BSLs not very good, then you can add the short acting or premixed insulin. Now, let me show you guys this one. Um, very easy uh, and very, very important um, article for you guys. So, um, you can read all of it. I'm just going to show you the technique of adding. How to start insulin. So you know about different types of insulin. Let me just load this up. So we target different types of insulin, right? Your fasting and preperindial or two hours postperindial should be your targets. So this is fasting and this is the after bedtime. If before breakfast, over 12 hours or 24 hours period of the night, your fasting before the breakfast is very high. We start with the basal ones, right? If the patient is having glycemic problems after the breakfast, there is high doses after the breakfast, after the breakfast, after the meal, then you can add premix insulin or short actings before the breakfast to control the daytime preperindial BSLs and help control the postperindial um, BSL risings. Is that clear, guys? So we need to know about when patient is having high BSL rise. Then we will target it accordingly with the long acting or basal or short acting with premixed or premixed. There are different types of insulins, but the, the basic one is the same, okay? If fasting hyperglycemia is problem, basal insulin would be appropriate, like the long acting one, such as glagine or detrima. In some patients, postperindial excursions are problematic and they are typically having very high BSLs postperindial. So in that patients, BSL can normalize the fasting glucose, but it cannot normalize the postperindial ones. That's why we use the pre-mixed insulin formations, which not only cover the fast uh, the postperindial one, it can also help with the fasting blood glucose levels as well. Is it clear? So that is why it's very important to ensure that the patient you're having and monitoring the glycemic control should have equal amount of carbohydrates or roughly the same caloric intake so that when you're putting them on the regime, according to their BSL rises, they're not having any hypoglycemic episodes. All right, guys, give this article a read. It's very, very informative, especially for, uh, for um, interns who are just starting their um, house jobs or are just doing their intern years. Very, very informative about how the uh, insulin regime works. Is it clear, guys? So number one, don't rely on just the recalls, all right? Don't rely on just the recalls. Try to figure out the topic. Try to figure out the topic they're thinking about. Dr. Vakas, you can just take a photo from your um, 
um, computer about the links and then type it up in the Google and they will come up with the article. Don't worry about this one. What's the indication for using a mixed preparation? Mixed preparation can also help you with the fasting and the postperindial glucose. So if you don't want to put a patient uh, on long acting twice a day, just before the meals you want to be putting them on, you can use a mixed preparation. They can act as a long acting and a short acting because they will control the postperindial sugars as well and they will have a basal effect of the insulin as well. All right, next question. A recurrent vaginal candidal infection. A patient presents to you with a white curd like discharge and pruritus. What's the next step to do? Very easy question. Vaginal swab, fluconazole, OGTT, HIV antibody test, or seize the oral contraceptive pill. Very good. So, even if it's a recurrent vaginal infection, the first thing with any vaginal discharges we take a swab we always take a swab doesn't matter if it is the fifth episode or the seventh episode or the 11th episode this patient is having the first thing is that we take a vaginal swab and then if it's a recurrent infection then we treat them accordingly with fluconazole ogtt can only be done afterwards it's not the first step OGTT can be done in a recurrent vaginal infection just to rule out if the patient is having diabetes or not. But it's not the first step to do whenever a patient is coming to you with a vaginal discharge. The first step is to diagnose it. Doesn't matter if you already know the diagnosis. HIV antibody, we don't do it in vaginal candidal infection unless the OGTT is negative. Then we need to think about what's causing her to be immunosuppressant. C's oral contraceptive pills. We don't know if the patient is on oral contraceptive pills. They haven't mentioned anything um, in the question about oral contraceptive pills. So this, this makes it nil and void. All right. Oh, how many times in recurrent? I think in, in three months time, it's a, a two times episode is a recurrent infection. I'm not sure. Let me just double check for you. But I do think it's like, uh, we don't start, the, we will start the fluconazole, but we, first we'll take a vaginal swab. We need to take a vaginal swab. For the recurrent infections, we, we give fluconazole, oral fluconazole. Whenever a patient is coming to you with a vaginal discharge or vaginal infection, please um, don't uh, go ahead with starting the treatment. Always do the investigations. It's a very simple investigation. Vaginal swab. Oh, sorry, this is not coming up. Let me just type it up. So if you are going to be studying the population health, which is the STI guidelines, I, I recommend you guys to study it from the Australian STI management guidelines. Even though it's not a sexually transmitted disease, it will come up over here. Candidal infection. So this is the resource. Mm, sorry. this one. So just go over here and look for candida. Candidiasis. All right. Candida species can be normal flora and therefore not need treatment if asymptomatic. It can be a sexually transmitted, but it's not usually considered a sexually transmitted disease. So it doesn't come uh, under the sexually transmitted disease, okay? Um, can arise spontaneously or secondary to disturbance of the normal vaginal flora. For example, patient is having antibiotic therapy or increased estrogen levels like pregnancy, postmenopausal estrogen therapy causes we know it's candida albicans clinical presentation 
in females there will be thick white clumpy vaginal discharge curd like genital vulvar itch burning sensation or soreness very common symptoms because of this burning itching sensation and constant itch it can cause tears in the skin and also can also lead to dyspareunia external dysuria excoriation erythema fissures of the skin so recurrent, um, one of the doctors were asking me, what is the recurrent infection? It's defined as four or more episodes in a 12-month period. So four or more episodes in a year is defined as recurrent. Sorry, I was wrong about that. Um, other consideration is that patient can have diabetes, can have HIV infections, but that is not the first thing that you diagnose. You do a vaginal uh, swab. And then later on, if you're thinking like why this patient is having recurrent, then you rule out diabetes and an HIV from that patient. So high vaginal swab you take and you give a, go for the microscopy and culture of it and it will come up with the candidiasis. It can be self-collected uh, as well. Management, if it is an uncomplicated month, we can give patient azole creams. Um, if it's a recurrent, then we give azole cream and also treat with the fluconazole 150 milligram for three doses, three days apart, followed by maintenance dose of the fluconazole for weekly for six months. So we give a course of 150 milligram orally for three days, three times a day, and then every week for six months for the recurrent one. Um, what else? Uh, special situations will be the pregnant females. In pregnant females, we know that we can't give fluconazole or boric acid, so we just give topical treatment to them. We don't have a diagnosis. Patient has a history of recurrent infection now coming to us with a vaginal discharge that is curdy and she's having itchiness. We know it might be vaginal candidiasis, but it's not confirmed with an investigation that it's, yes, we you do have to unfortunately memorize this whole treatment and more many more of others. While doing recalls, do we need to do the whole topic from Australian guideline or just find the answer to our question? Um, I would recommend you that if you're if you have already opened the guideline, just go through it quickly. Give it a good read. Sometimes we, we can remember the things we have read just once. So if you give it a good read, that will be a good way of studying it. All right. Next question, guys. Do we need to study the incorrect options too? It's a be better way of studying like why this option is not a correct option because this option, in this way, you'll not just be covering the topic with the answer, you'll be covering the five topics all together. So I always recommend you guys that um, if you're studying the correct options, also study the incorrect options as well. Have some idea why the incorrect options are incorrect. All right. A child of five years of age has presented to the emergency department with acute shortness of breath. He has history of asthma. He has taken one puff of salbutamol, but with no effect. What is the next step in management of this patient? Another 11 puffs of salbutamol, ipratropium bromide nebulization, steroids oral, or ICU consultant should review the patient. All right, so some people are answering apratropium bromide. Look guys, if you have taken only a single puff, it's not going to help at all. So a patient at least need to take, it's a five-year-old patient. So six puff, six breath, another six puff, another six breath, another six puff. Or sometimes we do four puffs, four breaths, four puffs, four breaths, four puffs, Four breath. So this formula is for kids and adults. Four into four into four. You repeat it in the first 20 minutes of the acute episode. 
if patient is not responding to this much, then you start with the oral steroids and add on the ipratropium bromide to the cell butamol nebulization or inhalation through the metered um, spacer device. But a single puff is not going to do anything. So option A is correct over here. ICU consultant is never going to see your patient unless the patient is almost dead or dying and or patient is not responding to the acute treatment protocol of the asthma. All right, so another 11 puffs is required. So this is from the Queensland Health Guideline. You can guys can just open it up or you can look into it. Asthma emergency management of the children. You guys already know about the asthma history as well. Clinical assessment you guys need to know about. You need to check the respiratory rate and phase of respiration. Whether the patient is having increased work of breathing and he's using the accessory muscles like there is intercostal substernal recession or not. What's the saturation of the patient? What's the heart rate if patient is cyanosed or not? Blood pressure and pulse is being affected or not? Or whether patient is just irritable or becoming drowsy? So on these basis, we have mild, moderate, severe, and life-threatening asthma. Investigation. You don't need to do any investigations because uh, in acute asthma, we know just by clinically that patient is having an acute respiratory attack. So we start with the management. We can do it later on. So meter dose inhaler, 100 micrograms of entilane, five years, six puffs, six puffs, six puffs, age six or more, 12 puffs. So salbutamol puffs, three doses, like six into six into six at 90 minutes interval, 20 minutes interval. So six puffs, six breaths, and then again, six puffs, six breaths, again, six puffs and six breaths. That, that is completed over 20 minutes. If the patient is not responding, then you move on to the epiratopium bromide or um, as a, in a spacer device or as an nebulization and then start the patient on oral steroids. Spacer device is very, very effective, believe me. And prednisolone, you can give to the patient of moderate or mild asthma attack orally, but in a severe or life-threatening, it's recommended that you give IV, methyl prednisolone, or hydrocortisone. Uh, Ipratropium or bromide is useful in combination in the early management, but after you have done the salbutamol bust, all right, after that, you can do the ipratropium bromide um, similar to the salbutamol in combination with it after the first 20 minutes if the patient is not responding to it. Magnesium sulfate, that is done by the ICU. Um, intravenous salbutamol, that is also administered by the ICU aminophylline. ICU registrars will give us an information about whether they're happy to do it or not. So there is a flow chart at the end of every guideline in Queensland Health, so give it a good read, this one. Salbutamol burst, intranasal device, three doses. Salbutamol burst or meter dose device. For adults, it's 12 puffs. And for children, above six, 12. Less than six, it's six puffs. All good, guys? Three doses of six puffs, three doses of 12 puffs in 20 minutes. So what we do is like six, uh, six doses, six time breathe, six minutes gap, repeat six, 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 Repeat 666 six, six in 20 minutes time. All right, next question. 76 year old male came to the GP clinic with the symptoms of fever and cough on and off. He also has been losing weight. Now he's complaining of right-sided eyelid drooping and feels like the rights of the face is not sweating enough. You have ordered chest x-ray with the following findings. What is the next step in the management? Do a biopsy, do the CT scan of the chest, do a PET scan or start the patient on antibiotics. 
What is the diagnosis? Can anyone tell me the diagnosis associated with the very good Pankos syndrome? So you have just done a chest X-ray. What is the next thing that you want to do in order to find out more about this Pankos tumor? Very good. We want to do a CT scan of the chest. PET scan will be done after the CT scan. But first, we want to do a CT scan IV contrast of the chest to know about the anatomy of this tumor. Then we'll do the PET scan to see whether there is any dissemination PET CT scan or any metastasis of this tumor anywhere else in the body. Very good. So if it's a first radiology, which is the X-ray which has been done, then our, it's always recommended that you redefine it with the help of a CT scan. If you look over here, guys, I'm just gonna make the screen a bit enlarged. Oh, so if you look over here, if you're having signs and symptoms of lung cancer, you take the history, you do the assessment, you do the liver function test, uh, renal function test, bone profiles, full blood count and the clotting profile, and then you do the chest x-ray. On the chest x-ray, if it's normal, you just observe and manage the patient. If it's not normal and you are having a suspicion of the tumor, then you do a contrast in hand CT of the thorax and up, upper abdomen. Afterwards, you can decide based on the best approach whether the patient needs a biopsy through the bronchoscopy or whether the patient needs a CT guided biopsy. Kindly explain findings on the x-ray. All right, so uh, let's just increase the size of the x-ray a bit. All right. This is the interior posterior view of the chest. All the bones are alive, trachea is mid midline, lungs are normal, there is no shadows on the hilar region, cardiac shadow is appropriate to the thoracic cage. We can appreciate the costophrenic angles as well. We can see the breast tissue shadow. If you look at the apical area of the lungs, you can find a consolidation like thing on the upper lobe of the right side of the lung. That looks more like a tumor rather than a consolidation. Is it clear, guys? Are you able to see this? All right, good. Just going to make this a bit shorter so it fits the screen. Sorry, it's taking me a bit of time. All right. All right. Last question before we take a 10 minutes break, okay? Oh. Sorry, I'm just... Uh... Elderly man is coming to you with fecal incontinence, past history of diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and radiation of the prostate cancer. What can be the cause of the incontinence? Radiation, proctitis, encoperesis, fecal impaction, tumor of the anal region. Very good. Option A is correct. Now, what happens in the prostate cancer radiation, sometimes it's given through the anal region to the prostate, that is the targeted radiotherapy. So if it's done by that, it can cause the anal sphincter to become a bit wonky and it can cause fecal incontinence. So radiation proctitis is oncoprasis is not common in elderly men at all. Fecal impaction can occur and it can lead to spurious diarrhea, but it doesn't cause fecal incontinence. It's cause impaction leading to spurious diarrhea. 
tumor of the inner region if the patient was having like difficulty opening bowels hemorrhage so that would be a better answer but in incontinence it doesn't cause incontinence causes more of bleeding when the patient is opening the bowels yes b is common in children and less than 5 years of age oh sorry more than 5 years of age it's a problem on coprasis all right patients experiencing radiation proctitis may present with malabsorption perforation bowel obstruction bleeding and stricture formation they can also present with fistulous disease if the anal sphincter is directly involved in the radiation field patient may present with the fecal incontinence clear guys mcbi or pub uh, mcbi these are also good sources of um, guidelines cuz they are evidence based studies all right so let's take a 10 minutes break now And we'll come back, take some rest, hydrate yourself, and then we'll come back and finish the class today. 10 minutes break.
Welcome back, guys. Let's continue our session. <clears throat> I hope you had a good break. All right. Next question is, a burnt patient came to you with the singed hair of the nose, strider, cherry red face, vitals are stable. Next most appropriate management. Hyperbaric oxygen, intubation or IV hydration. Very good. So whenever they ask you questions about emergency medicine, always start with the airway, breathing, circulation, um, detoxification and exposure, disability and exposure. So always start with the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure approach. So here, our first step, because the patient has been having inhalation injury, our first step should be intubation. If the first option was oxygenation, not hyperbaric oxygen, would you still select the intubation or would, would the first step will be to provide oxygen via face marks to the patient? What would be your answer then? So whenever we are intubating a patient, do we deprive them of oxygen or just intubate them? Or do we do bag and mask ventilation with the oxygen and then intubate the patient? Very good. We give oxygen to the patient while we're waiting for the setup of the whole thing, right? So bag and mask or the face mask oxygenation to the patient while we're preparing for the intubation. So first step, if they have given like oxygenation, go for that. Then we do the intubation. Very good, guys. So if you look over here, this is the um, inhalation injury guideline. It's an article, it's not a guideline, but it's an article that can give you a guideline on the management of this management of the smoke and airway. So very important is history. Consult a senior anesthetist at an early stage if you, there you are having any doubts. Always provide supplemental oxygen through non-breathing mask, space C-spine, and do the primary survey of the patient. Have a low threshold for suspecting cyanide poisoning as well. So does the patient need intubation? So you need to figure it out by triaging the patient. If the patient GCS is low, if you have evidence of the upper airway inhalation injury, if the patient is having respiratory distress, if the patient is having deep facial burns, if the patient is having circumferential neck burns, increased swelling of the head and neck, if patient is having other significant trauma, if in doubt, intubate, do not, do not um, uh, go into the pros and cons of the intubation. If you have a single doubt, if you have even a single evidence that the patient is having inhalation injury, always think about the safety of the patient because inhalation injury will come up with the edema of the whole airway tract. So intubation at first instance will prevent you from having a difficult ventilation or difficult intubation later on. All right, so this is how you do it. Next question. Sixteen-year-old female asks for contraception and admits to having sexual intercourse recently for the first time. What to screen for? Human papilloma virus, chlamydia, or cervical cancer? 16 year old, recent sexual intercourse. So what is chl chlamydia? Can anyone clarify for me? Whenever a patient is having intercourse, what do we unprotect it? Very good. We always screen for the STI. We offer it to them. We don't force it. But if a patient is coming to us for contraception, very young of age, have recently engaged in the sexual activity, always offer them sexual and transmission infection screening and also education about protected sex. You can study from cervical screening starts at 25 years of age or if the patient before 25 years had sexual intercourse 
um, then you can give them once uh, cervical screening and then offer them afterwards from 25 years. So situation where clinicians should offer a STI testing to a person aged less than 16, when a young patient requests that, when they have STI symptoms, when they have pregnancy or suspected pregnancy, contact of a person with STI, request for contraception or termination of the pregnancy. All right. Situations where clinicians might considering raising the issues of sexual activity and offering STI to a person aged less than 16 is when they are among the people who have STI and have been diagnosed previously. They have an out break declared region, they have a sexualized behavior, they are addicted to alcohol or involved in illicit drug use. So you can offer them at that point as well. So instead, there was an answer option like oxygen or face mind question for next day, would you choose oxygen? But the question asked most appropriate management. Most appropriate would be intubation. I do agree with you. But if they are asking the next or the initial step, then oxygenation through a face mask or bag and mask ventilation would be your best option. All right. Next question. 28-year-old pregnant lady, 37 weeks of uh, gestation, history of twisting her ankle. Ankle swelling is there, pain is there, but she is able to move. There is no restriction of movement. You have applied compression brandage. You have asked her to keep it elevated. What other advice will you give to the patient? X-ray, ice pack, NSAIDs, or no treatment at all? Very good. So whenever a patient is having if there is no restriction of movements and there's just a swelling, a bit of bruising, then it, it is most of the time an ankle sprain. It doesn't require any radiological intervention. So we know that for sprain, what we use is the price method. Pain relief, um, resting, icing, compression, and elevation. Now, Pain is always paracetamol in the pregnant woman. We can't give NSAIDs to her in the third trimester because what does NSAIDs do to the pregnant lady in the third trimester? Delayed closure of the PDA. Very good. So how to treat a sprained ankle while pregnant? It's this. Grade one sprains can be treated with rice. Grade two, where there's splinting, needs to be treated by a podiatrist. They are basically the specialist specialist who who have you know good education about the foot care. All right, next question. A sixty year old female have acute onset of eye pain since four hours. Red eye, reduced visual acuity, very tender on palpation, and cornea is edematous. Which of the following is the diagnosis? Glaucoma, iritis, or conjunctivitis. So we all know acute red eye in an elderly with visual disturbance and tender palpation or cornea, edematous, or haziness is glaucoma. Very good. So the same emergency guideline that we have previously read, I'm just going to go to glaucoma quickly. Uh, I think glaucoma will be onwards from here. Oh, this is the visual loss. Should be here. Sorry, let me just find it quickly. Having a bit of difficulty.
Yes, the recording will be there for you guys. Okay, here it is. Acute angle closure glaucoma. So the patient will be coming to you with cornea that is hazy in appearance. Anterior chamber is shallow with irregular pupil. Affected eye is very tender and very tense. Systemic symptoms will be there like headache, nausea, vomiting. Urgent referral to ophthalmologist is required for this. You give acetazolamide and timolol to the patient immediately. All good, guys? Any question? What is the guideline name, please? Um, this is the New South Wales uh, Ophthalmic Emergency Guideline. No worries. 18-year-old girl came to you for HPV vaccination. Her pap smear test last six months ago, it's normal. She has regular three sexual partners. What will you recommend for her? Give her HPV vaccination as she has requested. Do the pap test again. Tell her HPV vaccination is not affected to her. Or check the STD screenings and then give the HPV vaccine as requested. Why not pilocarpine? For which question, doctor? For this question, there is no pilocarpine in this question. Oh, pilocarpine is not the first agent that you use for um, glaucoma. It's acetozolamide and topical beta blockers. Look, guys, this is an ethical question. So if a patient is just coming to you for HPV vaccination, we will not check the STD screenings. We will offer it to her. So here, they have not worded it correctly for the option D to be the correct one. Check STD to screening without her permission, very, very wrong. Or check STD is not a good word. Offer STD screenings and then give HPV vaccine as requested is good one. So the best one among these is give the HPV vaccination as she has requested. If they have said in option D that offer her the STD screening, then that would have been a good option, the best option among all of these. But they have like, written like check. Check means without any request. So if they haven't worded it like that, please don't select this option. It's the incorrect option among these. All right. Is it clear, guys? Pap test is, we don't use the word pap test anymore. We use the word cervical screening test now. A sensory loss over the lateral border of the shoulder, lateral arm, lateral forearm, and thumb. What is the sensation from? CAT1, C5, C6, axillary, or radial? Do we have to? Yes, we have to have proper consent for the uh, sexually transmitted infection screening. If you can't do a written one, at least do a verbal one. So a patient is having the sensory loss of the lateral border of the shoulder and lateral arm, lateral forearm and thumb. Let me just open up. So which dermatome is it? Look at this one, guys, and now give me the answer. C5, shoulder um, sensation is lateral part of the shoulder. C6, lateral part of the arm, thumb, and index finger. C7 is just the middle finger. C8 is ring finger and little finger and also medial part of the arm. T1 is the medial part of some of the arm and most part of the uh, sorry, some of the forearm and most part of the arm. So now the option is C5 and C6 that is having the sensory loss. All right. Next question. 67-year-old man, COPD, wife 65 years of age, make an appointment concerning that she might have COPD too. She smokes 20 cigarettes for 40 years. Shortness of breath with sputum over six months. No fever, night sweat, weight loss. CT scan excludes any lung lesion. Which of the following confirms the COPD diagnosis? Hyperinflation of the lung with the bronchial wall thickening on a chest X-ray. Spirometry FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 80% and FEV1 less than 70 predicted after the bronchodilator. Spirometry FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 70 with FEV1 less than 80% of the predicted value after the bronchodilator. 
presence of a daily productive cough for more than three months in smoker or ex-smoker. Spirometry, FEV1 to FVC less than 70 and FEV1 less than 70 predicted before the bronchodilator. So which one of the following confirms the Option C is correct, guys. Whenever we have a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 70. And after a bronchodilator, there's less than 80% increase in a FEV1 predictive value, not less than 70. Okay? It's option C that is correct. So if you look over here, Normally, what we have is the post-expiratory volume in one second to full uh, volume, uh, functional volume capacity. The percentage is more than 70%. And percentage of the expected FEV1 predicted value is more than 80%. And that of the FVC is more than 80% as well. But when we have a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, even with a bronchodilator, there is not going to be increased capacity of the lung. and Percentage will be less than that of the 70 of the ratio, and the predictive value will also be less than 80 after the bronchodilator, but because the bronchodilator is not increasing the oxygen flow because the capacity of the lungs have decreased in it. Um, in restrictive, the FEV1 to FVC ratio will be more than 70, whereas FEV1 will be less than 80, same as that of the COPD patients. Combination will have similar results to that of the COPD, but FVC will be less than 80% if it is having somewhat restrictive pattern in it. All right, next question. Patient is presenting with recurrent vertigo. There is no hearing loss. What is the diagnosis? Minier, vestibular neuritis, otosclerosis. Very good. So if patient is coming with just vertigo and there is no hearing loss, then you think about any viral infection to the vestibular neuron part. If the vertigo is associated with the hearing loss and it's recurrent, then we might be thinking of other causes like menial disease. In otosclerosis, there is no vertigo. There is a conductive hearing loss. And it especially happens in pregnant females, less than 20 years of age. BPPV, very good. In a benign proximal positional vertigo, there will be no hearing loss. Whereas in the vestibular, oh, sorry, labyrinthitis and menus disease, there will be hearing loss. All right, look at this one. They have very good algorithms over here. So in labyrinthitis, there will be hearing loss with continuous vertigo and there will be evidence of the upper respiratory tract infection. Whereas in vestibular neuritis, there will be no hearing loss or tinnitus. There will just be vertigo and it is usually happens after upper respiratory infection. In Menius disease, there will be recurrent hearing loss, episodic vertigo, but it's it's there is no association with the upper respiratory infection. Rather, the fluid inside the cochlear canals, there's a disturbance of that. BPPV, no hearing loss, just episodic vertigo with position changes. Acoustic neuroma, because it's a tumor, it will come up with a unilateral hearing loss insidious onset of the vertigo and the cerebellar features like ataxia and facial numbness. Next question. Any query, guys? So always remember there will be no hearing loss as doc uh, a doctor has said in BPV and vestibular neuritis. BPV just positional vertigo, vestibular neuritis, upper respiratory tract infection following the vertigo. In acoustic neuroma, there will be unilateral hearing loss with the uh, extrapyramidal uh, symptoms. Um, and in uh, labyrinthitis and menius disease, there will be hearing loss and uh, vertigo. But in labyrinthitis, there will be usually a respiratory tract infection, where in menial disease, there will be nothing like that. 
All right. Next question. 15 year old pregnancy test is positive living with her parents. She doesn't want you to inform this to anyone. Father of the baby is her 30 year old uncle. What do you do next? Inform the child protection services, inform the parents or in, arrange a meeting with the uncle. Now, I agree with you guys that we need to inform the child protection services, but look at the very important clue they have given you. She's living with the parents and a minor. So we'll inform the parent first and then involve the child protection services because the father of the baby is 30 year old and is her relative. That's a crime. That's a crime over here. So if a patient is a minor and is having her is involved in sexual intercourse consensual with a partner who is plus minus two years elder than her and is not her uncle not a relative not someone who is a supervisor of any kind like a teacher or a coach then they can continue with the pregnancy and it's not considered a sexual offend but if a minor is minor is less than 18 but if a minor is 15 or less and she is not living with the parents, having still a boyfriend of two years or more, then we don't need to inform the parents. We don't need to inform anyone. She can continue to have that sexual relationship. But if the father of the baby is a more than two years age gap, is a authority figure or someone relative to her, and she is not living with her parents, inform the child protection services. But if she's living with her parents, Inform the parents first and then involve the child protection services. Guardians is important. Yes, there is a bit of difference. Gillick competence is there. So when a patient is living with guardians and a sexual offend, offense have been done, inform the guardians first and then uh, inform the child protection services. But if she is not living with the parents and is has been... Uh, abused sexually by a 30 year old uncle then you don't inform the guardians you inform the child protection services is it clear guys if she was not living with the parents then sure but she is living with the parents and the baby of the the father of the baby 30 year old uncle we need to inform the parents because this is an offense. If the baby of the father was a boyfriend of similar age group, then sure, you can keep the confidentiality for the patient. But if the patient is clearly having a, uh, a sexual harassment, then you need to inform the guardians as well as the child protection services. Is it clear, guys? ECG of a VT in a two-year-old boy, which of the following is the management? So a ventricular tachycardia is happening in a two-year-old baby. Face in the cold water, IV adenosine, carotid massage, or IV amiodarone? Very good. So it doesn't matter if it is ventricular tachycardia in an adult or in a child. If it is a hemodynamically stable patient, then we can give a IV amiodarone. If it was a hemodynamic unstable patient, we can give DC cardioversion for the patient. Um, look, every ethics opinion is different with different doctors. So what I have learned so far by working in Australian health system is that if a patient is living with the parent, and is having a sexual offense towards her and she's saying not to inform the parents and also uh, the sexual offense is committed by a 30 year old you need to inform the parents and then child protection services all right for the ventricular tachycardia you can go through the um, emergency guideline for the ventricular tachycardia in the pediatric age group so CPR has been started. You look at the rhythm, whether it's shockable or not. Pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation is shock. 
and then give um, adrenaline and then shock again and then give amiodarone. But if it's asystole or pulseless electrical activity, you give adrenaline immediately. We don't start, we don't give the shock in these patients. So you guys need to remember this very important for your exam. All right, next question. 30 year old is coming to you with a painful knee, painful urination before the onset of the painful knee. Physical examination shows um, edematous knee and bilateral conjunctivitis with the mucopurulent discharge. Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteochondritis desiccans, pigmented villonedular tenosynovitis with gouty arthritis or reactive arthritis. Very good. So whenever a patient is coming with dysuria following the joint involvement, always, and there's an eye involvement, always think about the reactive arthritis caused by the sexually transmitted infection, especially chlamydia. Chlamydia most commonly causes the reactive arthritis. So if you look over here, Reactive arthritis, pattern of the reactive arthritis is commonly involves the lower limb and prominent pain and edema are classically described. It's caused by the sexually transmitted infection like chlamydia. And it's different from, its differential diagnosis is juvenile idiopathic arthritis, but reactive arthritis are self-limited and requires only NSAID treatment, whereas juvenile idiopathic arthritis are very um, progressive disease, pigmented villain nodular. Synovitis. So it's the inflammation of the synovial joints, rare condition, and they cause the joints to overgrow. So a patient will present with the swelling of the area and damage to the bone around the joint. So we take the aspiration and under the microscope, we see pylonidus, uh, pigmentation or villonodular pigmentation. So this is how it presents a very slow growing benign, um, you can say a condition in which the synovial membrane overgrows with the pilonodular microvascular features. Is it clear? It will, they will present with just one joint swelling and when you aspirate the fluid, you will know about it. No worries. Management of the psoriasis arthritis is which of the following? Prednisolone, methotrexate, or sulfasalazine? Management of the psoriasis arthritis is by methotrexate. Guys, it's not with the help of prednisolone. Let me just show you guys. We give immunosuppressive therapy. Because uh, steroids will just make the psoriatic arthritis worse. So it's, con it's associated with the psoriasis. It usually comes up with the arthritis, um, sausage-like fingers, and pitted or nail uncaused kylosis. Nail diseases will be there, ductilitis, fatigue, mouth ulcers. Association of the psoriasis with the skin, uh, with the patient who have psoriasis, they can have uh, autoimmune disease of the joints as well. You can do an x-ray to find out the um a diagnosis, asymmetrical joint involvement is there, erosion, pencil and cup-like subluxations or ankylosis will be there. You do the uh, inflammatory markers, rheumatoid factor, NTCCP, all will be negative, but the inflammatory markers will be raised. Um, some treatment for the psoriasis are also effective for skin. So treatment plays to take both skin and joint disease into account. Non-pharmacological management is the physical and occupational therapy. If the arthritis is mild and limited to us just few joints, then you can cause uh, do the topical therapies like with the phototherapies or with the NSAIDs and possibly corticosteroid injections. 
but if if you're treating a, a disseminated joint disease then you need to treat the patient with the methotrexate or other immunosuppressive DMARDs. So these are the ones. We don't give oral uh, uh, steroids. We don't give prednisolone to the patient. It makes the rash worse. We always, systemic steroids can help the arthritis, but can cause the steroids. But you can give oral methotrexate to the patient who are having all right. Is everything clear now? So if a patient is having psoriasis and if the patient is also having um, the arthritis, so don't give oral steroids. Otherwise, it's going to make the psoriasis worse. Um, you can use it. Uh, there's a book of ethics. Um, I don't remember the name, but there's a book of ethics that you guys can read. It's a very, very lengthy book. So I would advise you guys to whenever there is a recall coming in front of you guys just go through it and see through either any guy yes 100 cases of ethics yep yep this book it's a very lengthy book so if you want to have a very good grip of an ethics you can read that answer is methotrexate we don't give steroids because it causes flare-up of the psoriasis 42 year old request heart check Family history, father, uncle, aunt, all had MI in late 40s and 50s. There is no symptoms in her. Her blood pressure is 125 by 85. Heart rate is 75. Eye findings is that she is having cornea arcus. Next step in management, refer her directly to the clinical genetic services or check her Dutch lipid clinical network criteria for the familial hypercholesteremia. Very good. So whenever a patient is having features of hyperlipidemia, we always check the uh, Dutch lipid clinical network criteria to see whether she might be having hypercholesteremia or not if it's, she's young. So she's 42 already and she's having the corneas arcus, which is like a lipid layer around the cornea. So we do this scoring in which we do the biochemical investigation by checking the lipid levels. We do clinical investigation like we check for arcus cornelius or tendons and thomas then we check the medical family history check the past family history and then make a score if the patient is having more than eight then she is definitely having the familial hypercholesteremia if it is six to seven probable three to five le possible and less than three is unlikely so this dutch scoring system uh dutch lipid network scoring system is very appropriate and saves a lot of headache from going towards the genetic screening for hypercholesteremia. No, there is an RSGB site for ethics, sorry. Next question, 20 year old lady is presenting to you with a lower abdominal pain exacerbated by exercise. She has bad period pain, pain during sexual intercourse as well. She is on oral contraceptives and negative urine and pregnancy test. What is the likely cause of her pain? Irritable bowel syndrome, inguinal hernia, pelvic inflammatory disease, or primary dyspareunia. Very good. So patient is having pain during period, abdominal pain during exercise, which is like movement, and also dyspareunia. They all indicate she might be having the pelvic inflammatory disease. Irritable bowel syndrome, just abdominal pain. No pain during period, no pain during sexual intercourse. Inguinal hernia, same. She, the inguinal hernia will not be causing any reproductive organ pain unless the inguinal hernia is twisted around the reproductive organ. Primary dyspareunia is sexual intercourse pain does not cause pain during period. It's just pain during sexual intercourse. It can be because of the vaginism as well. If endometriosis, yes, endometriosis can also be one of the very good differentials here. Because the urine and pregnancy test is negative, it, if endometriosis is given, then that would be a much better option. Because urine in pelvic inflammatory disease might be contaminated with the vaginal findings. So endometriosis will be a good option then as well. All right, next question. 
a clinic treats IV drug abuser patient. Now they want to know from you as GP what advice you can give to the hepatitis B positive mothers. Avoid breastfeeding. Check uh, hepatitis surface antigen in infant or hot hospital administration to all the patients. When do we check the hepatitis uh, surface antigen in a infant born to hepatitis B positive mothers? Can anyone tell me? Your answer is absolutely right. 9 to 12 months. Very good. Very good. And when do we check for hepatitis C? 18 months. We check in hepatitis C positive mothers uh, in 18 months. The surface markers, oh, sorry, uh, hepatitis C V viral load. And the surface marker we check in the infants in 9 to 12 months. It's the immunization handbook of Australia. You can study every immunization disease from here. So infant born to hepatitis B positive agent recommends that they should have hepatitis B vaccination as well as immunoglobulin. Antibody levels are checked at three to month, 12 months or a, we check at the nine months of age. And we give hepatitis B vaccination along with the immunoglobulin. Next question. 34-year-old lady on oral contraceptive pills and methotrexate for Crohn's disease. She is planning pregnancy and stopping oral contraceptive pills. What is the advice regarding the methotrexate in pregnancy? Increase the risk of teeth staining in fetus? Increase folic acid to 5 milligram and reduce her dose of methotrexate and or it should be seized at least three months before the conception. Why we are stopping the methotrexate? Can anyone tell me? You're absolutely right. Very good. It's teratogenic. So even with a low dose, it can cause problems during embryogenesis of the baby or organogenesis of the baby. So we always advise in males and females both because in males, if they are uh, thinking of having a baby, they should stop taking methotrexate because it causes aspermia as also more changes in the morphology of the sperm. In the females, it is teratogenic. So seize it three months before the pregnancy. You can have a look at this one. It gives you some information about why we are stopping it. It's not recommended as it can cause birth effects and it reduces fertility as well. So if you're planning or already pregnant, stop methotrexate. It can cause birth defects. Uh, it damages the sperm in men and egg production in females. And it can cause birth defects if taken during the pregnancy. Ask your doctor about changing to a different medications or before you stop using contraception. Tell your doctor if you're trying to get pregnant, is are pregnant or are breastfeeding. All right. Next question. 22-year-old girl came to you today. She rolled left ankle during netball. She has an antalgic gait. There's a mild lateral swelling, no deformity or bone tenderness, and there's reduced restriction of movement. You suspect she is having uncomplicated mild lateral ligament sprain and recommend rest, ice, compression, and elevation. What is the next management? Immobilization in a back slab for two weeks? Refer her to the physiotherapist for rehabilitation for six weeks or refer her to the orthopedic surgeon for the repair of the sprain. We don't recommend immobilization. We recommend compression, elevation, resting, icing, and pain relief. But we also recommend for the patient to go through rehabilitation program for at least six weeks. So we always refer them to our occupational, sorry, physiotherapist who can help them with some exercises that can cause them to regain functional motility in their legs. So this is the ligament that is usually having sprain. So um, 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 mild to moderate, is treatable with early mobilization and guided proprioceptive and strengthening rehabilitation program. The severe ligamental strains will require a back slab 
or a cam walker followed by the strengthening rehabilitation program. If there is a fracture, then you refer to the orthopedic surgeon. Next question. I hope you guys are, I'm, I'm, I'm not rushing. I hope you guys are having a clear concept. Sorry if I'm not asking after every question if the concepts are clear. But let me know if you have any questions in the chat box, guys, okay? Elderly lady is presenting with atrial fibrillation. She has mitral stenosis as well. High blood pressure, osteoarthritis. She had had stable INR for six months and she is on warfarin, four milligram daily and her EGFR is 69. So it's like mild to moderate um, renal function test. And her liver function tests are normal. INR is now 3.8. And she had a nosebleed this AM with no other issues. Claims she already took the warfarin as a Twice and did not change her diet significantly. What is the next step you would advise her? Advise her not to take the warfarin today and check the recheck her INR tomorrow, or advise her to go to the emergency department and have an urgent administration of the prothrombin complex. Very good. So, if a patient is having just a mild bleeding and her INR is a bit high, so you ask them to skip the next dose of the warfarin and recheck their INR. But if they're having like a life-threatening bleeding, I advise them to go to the emergency so that we can reverse the effect of the warfarin by giving prothrombinex or FFPs to the patient. Now you can study the warfarin or the anticoagulation guideline through Queensland Health. It's amazing, amazing guideline. So... These are the INR target ranges for different diseases. Um, just wanted to let you guys know what to do. So if a war, if a INR is more than three, stop warfarin, repeat INR in three to five days. If Warfarin indicated again for the INR is dropping below your target range, then restart at one milligram. Usually we start the warfarin at three milligram, right? And then increase to six milligram till six milligram if the INR is less than 1.4. If the INR is 1.4 to 1.5, five milligram. 1.6 to 1.8, four milligram. 1.9 to 2.1, maintain at 3. 2.2 to 2.5, reduce to 2.5. You don't need to memorize it. I, I'm just giving you an idea how, about how, how you will, we maintain an INR. We monitor while we play with the doses of the warfarin. And every time we increase 1 milligram dose, we have to measure the INR in the next 3 to 5 days. And if it's not ne anywhere near the target, we just increase by one milligram or 0.5 milligram of dose and then recheck again. That's how we do. All right. Second last question. Any question, guys? So don't get confused or worried about the anticoagulation guidelines. So very simple. Just go through the Queensland Health uh, anticoagulation guideline. They have written each and every detail that you want to know about it, whether the patient is in the community or whether the patient is in the hospital, whether you're just monitoring or whether you're treating or reversal of the anticoagulation, what you need to do, everything is in there. So give it a very good read when you're preparing for your exam. 67-year-old man, worsening COPD, green sputum, salbutamol overuse, Perindopril for high blood pressure penicillin allergy. He reports that he is already using his salbutamol meter dose inhaler 12 puffs every three to four hours through the spacer device at home. But he is struggling to cope because of the breathlessness. But he doesn't require a hospital admission yet because you have already triaged him. What is the most appropriate treatment you would start in the operation? Oral prednisolone with oral amoxicillin or prescribe oral prednisolone with doxycycline? Very big clue here. Very good. So we are starting doxycycline because patient is allergic to penicillin. Excellent. You need to focus on little details in the exam. They are going to help you solve the question. If you focus, then it's very easy to solve the question. 
then it's very easy to pass the exam as well. Very good. 37 year old lady had sudden palpitations, dizziness, no chest pain, had underlying asthma with frequent salbutamol use. Each ECG shows there is a proximal supraventricular tachycardia. What is the first line treatment do you do for her? IV amiodarone, or salva maneuver, or metropolol. Very good. So now in every patient who is having symptomatic SVT, we perform a modified Valsava maneuver. Very good. If it's not, uh, patient is not responding, then we give a myodurone or adenosine. Adenosine, very good. So this is, if you look over here, Vagal maneuvers in which we do the modified Valsalva maneuver. It has a higher success in which patient blows on a syringe for 15 seconds, sitting in the upright position, and then we revert him to lay on his back. We lift his legs to 45 degree angles for 15 seconds. Most of the time, the SVT reverts with this. If it's not helping, then we start with the dose um, loading and the maintenance dose of the adenosine. All right, guys, that's the end of our session today. I hope you had a good time with me. I enjoyed a lot with you guys. You were, guys were very interactive during the session. Um, I hope I have given you some idea about how we work in a course and how we provide tools for our students to help them pass this exam. Um, this is a very doable exam. So if you study with the correct tools and guidance, definitely you'll be able to crack it. So I hope we are going to be seeing you in our next class. Thank you so much, all of you. If you have any questions, just um, message Dr. Arshan. He'll be able to guide you with any queries you are having. And I welcome any students who are going to be joining the course. If not, then all the best for your exams in the future. Just remember, this is a very doable exam. And if you are having the correct tools, if you're studying in the correct way, you'll be able to crack it, okay? Thank you so much and good night.